It's going to be on video. <laughs> Ready? Go. Okay. So part four, I think, may be our last um, series, sermon in the series, uh, uh, Breakthrough Encounters with Jesus. Please pray. I have a couple of sermon series that I have been praying about, uh, and so pray that the Lord will lead me in the right direction for next Sunday. A couple different um, things that the Lord has laid on my heart. But let's finish up with, uh, with talking about this idea of having a breakthrough and just Talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, let's read some scriptures. We've been reading these together. Hosea chapter 6. Let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. I love that phrase. That we may live in his presence. I know, um, man, the presence of Jesus changes everything. I say that a lot. Uh, I've experienced it in my own life. I hope that you have. If you haven't, I encourage you, pray about it. At home, just pray, Lord, you know, Mason always says that, that your presence is so wonderful and so great that I haven't really experienced it. I want to experience your presence uh, uh, it, it, nothing changes your life like the presence of Jesus. Uh, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us. Habakkuk chapter 2. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, Joel chapter 2, of course, which happened in Acts chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's us. Amen. We are all people. Our sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So the last week of May in 1993 was the end of my first spring semester at Fresno City College. And I went out and partied with my friends that weekend like I always do. Did. <laughs> the first week of June, 1993, I moved to Ivanhoe, right over there on Avenue 327, moved in with my grandma, and I gave my life to Jesus because I had come to the very end of things. I grew up in church. I knew that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, but I was not living for him, and my, I just, my life was miserable because I had a grandma and some family members that were praying that I would get saved. One of the, I can't remember who was sharing their testimony uh, at the outreach event, but someone was sharing their testimony, uh, it might have been Caesar, and talking about, you could be at a party and the Spirit of God will touch your heart. And people might have thought, like, oh, that's crazy, right? I remember being at a solo cup party, right? The red cup party. And being there with my friends, and I remember, sorry, I just started crying. Just tears coming out of my face. Of course, my friends were all heathens. <laughs> and so I was just there with, a, with my beer in my hand, just crying tears. And my friends were like, what in the heck is going on? What's the matter with you? I was crying, we shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> this is right. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want us to do this. <laughs> so, but I was at the end of, of I was at the end of everything in my life. I just, if to me, I had come to this place 
Oh, only, I was only 19 years old, but I'll, I had already come to this position where I decided if this is all there is, then it's not enough, and if something doesn't change, then there's no point in living. So that's why I said, you know what, I'll just finally surrender to Jesus. I mean, right, it's either, it's either I surrender to him and something happens in me to me, or then if it's not real, then plan B is still an option. So, so I came down and gave my life to Jesus. First Sunday of June, I was sitting right there where Raina is sitting, except they used to be pews. Yeah. More, it was more anointed back then. We had pews, <laughs> not chairs. So I, I always sat there every Sunday. Uh, and, and I met Pastor Amos, and I met Pastor Phil. Uh, and for the next 10 years, I sat under Pastor Amos's preaching with an emphasis on preaching. Uh, he was a Pentecostal, Holy Ghost-filled preacher, yeller, pounder, foot stomper, right? Not, it was not like, I mean, me and him, not the same style. Um, and, and I would estimate that probably 50% of his pulpit ministry was dedicated to preaching on the topic and subject that, that the church needs revival. He would read and study about revival in the church uh, and the impact that it had on the lives of millions and billions of people around the world. He was passionate about preaching the subject of revival because he was convinced by the scriptures and by church history. If you have never read revival history in the church and you're excited about Jesus, I encourage you. Google some books and buy some books on revival because it will it will stir a fire in your heart. There's been revival in the church history. Uh, and he was convinced that if we would return to our first love and fall passionately in love with Jesus, that we would experience the power of the Holy Spirit for ourselves. Right? When individuals start having their very own encounters with Jesus, the effect of that on the corporate body of Christ is multiplied, and the result of that multiplication is a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have come to refer to as revival. Jesus is pouring out his Holy Spirit on all of the earth right now, today. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit started on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and that outpouring has not stopped to this very morning. Amen. Jesus is going to pour out his Holy Spirit in Ivanhoe and Tulare County in greater measures than we have experienced before in our lifetimes, and I want to be a part of that. And I think we want to be a part of that. And, and I believe what my pastor has taught me, that we need revival. The church needs revival. So what can we do? Revival starts with individuals having their very own encounters with Jesus. You need your very own encounter with Jesus. And I need to have my very own encounter with Jesus. In John chapter 4, the woman by the well, you know, I, I was thinking... <coughs> Oh, this poor woman by the well. I think I could fit her into any service I preach. I, I'm sorry that I turn to John chapter 4 a lot, but this lady just covers a lot of things. Um, the woman by the well, John chapter 4, you know the story. Jesus is tired. He sits down by the well. We're not going to get into the whole part about, you know, the, the living water. And if you would ask me, I would have given it to you. Well, I guess I'm getting into it right now. Um, but late, we're going to look at some verses later that kind of apply to what we're talking about. So later on, after he's had the encounter, she has had an encounter with Jesus. Here's some verses. I'm just going to read the verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about what happened. Uh, verse 28 and 29. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town, and she told everyone, Come and see a man. He told me everything about my life. Could this be the Messiah? And then later on, verse 39, that they, she goes and shares the, the testimony about her encounter that she had. And it says, many of the Samaritans from that town 
believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. She had an encounter, her own personal encounter, and then she shared that encounter, and some people believed because of her encounter with Jesus. But then, later on, because of Jesus' words, many more became believers, and they said to the woman, we no longer believe that he's the Messiah because of your encounter with him, but now we believe that he's the Messiah because of our own encounter with him. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You can start with someone else's encounter, but you have to have your very own encounter. You can start following Jesus because of your parents or your grandparents and the encounter that they had, and they raised you, and you saw it, and you believe it. That's how you, you can start that way. But if you want to keep following Jesus, you cannot live off of your parents or grandparents' experience with Jesus. You have to have your own encounter. You can start following Jesus because of your friends or your spiritual mentors and the influence they had on you and the encounter that they had with Jesus. But if you want to keep following Jesus, someone else's encounter is not going to be enough. You need to have your very own encounter. Why is it so important that I have an encounter with Jesus? Because it starts with me, and then the me becomes we. It, it started with one person having an encounter. The woman by the well had her very own I encounter. She encountered Jesus for herself. Right? Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. But her I encounter then turned into a we encounter. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Right? Uh, and, and then their we encounter turned into so many individual I encounters. Right? We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man is really the Savior of the world. So it's the church's high calling to perpetuate right, that encounter circle over and over and over again. I encounter, and then we encounter. You encounter, and then they encounter. It's important to me that you have an encounter with Jesus because your encounter with Jesus becomes my encounter with Jesus. It's important that I have an encounter with Jesus for myself because my encounter with Jesus becomes your encounter with Jesus. And I'll give you an example from my own life, right? Pastor Phil Miller, uh, he had a powerful personal encounter with Jesus that changed his life radically, totally, completely, brand new person, on fire for God, right? Uh, and so when I met Pastor Phil, and I started spending time with him, I encountered Jesus through Pastor Phil. And that led me to wanting to encounter Jesus for myself, right? I, I met this man and all of the love and compassion and all, everything that he did, putting his life and heart's work and, uh, into sharing the gospel. I said, Master, there is, there has to be something real about this Jesus, and I don't want to just know Jesus through my pastor. I want to encounter the Jesus that my pastor encountered for myself. So. We're going to turn to some scriptures, uh, uh, and I'll show you what I mean and why I believe it, that we can have our breakthroughs when we have encounters with Jesus. Let's pray about this idea, and then we'll talk some more. Father, thank you this morning that we can be in your house with your word. Lord, I pray for all of us. I want to have my own I encounter. I want to encounter Jesus myself. Lord, I pray for my church family. 
I pray that everyone here, I think that most of us, probably all of us in this room, would say yes to that. I want my own encounter with Jesus, my personal encounter with Jesus. I don't want to, uh, I you know, I love good preaching. I love good worship. I love to hear other people's testimonies. Uh, uh, you know, that that's amazing. It's fantastic. But I need my own coming into the presence of of Jesus for myself, being touched by His Holy Spirit in my own life. I need that, Lord. We pray uh, that as we talk about this, that it will just be stirred in us, uh, uh, that this morning at these altars, that everyone here that wants to have their own encounter with Jesus will experience that for themselves. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus changes everything. When the Lord changes you, he changes everything. John chapter 9 is a story about a man who was born blind. Mm, let me just read. Jesus went along. He saw a man who was born blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus told them, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. After saying this, in verse 6, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes, and then he told him, Go to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so the man went where he was sent, and he washed where he was sent, and his eyes were miraculously opened. And he had an encounter with Jesus, and his life was so radically changed and transformed. Listen to what happens. And this is what I pray for all of us. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging, they, they said to one another, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some of them claimed that he wasn't, and others said, No, it's not the same guy, it just looks like him. And he insisted himself that, it's me. It's me. I'm the guy, right? Uh, I met this man, Jesus, and my life was so changed. They didn't even recognize him anymore. He was so transformed by his own encounter with Jesus that he didn't even look like he was the same person. That's something we should want for ourselves. What I want... Uh, as a follower of Jesus, and what I believe we should all want as followers of Jesus is for our lives to be so transformed by His grace uh, that it should make people wonder about us. Uh, is that even the same person that I used to know? If your old friends are disappointed in your new way of life, uh, good for you. I remember, like I said, I got saved when I was 19 years old. I left Fresno. I left everyone behind. Uh, I cut myself off from them and didn't have anything to do with any of them anymore. Not because I didn't love them, but because I knew that I couldn't handle being around it. Yeah. And, and I remember them saying things like, you know, you used to be so much fun. You, you used to be so much fun. Uh, to party with. Now all you ever talk about is Jesus and studying the Bible and, and church and all this crazy stuff. They thought I was crazy. Wow. Right? And that's how it is. It's, the world thinks we're crazy. Now, obviously, I think they're crazy. Sometimes I get so mad at my little self. My, my, I, I mean, I know it's only 19 years, so some people have lived a long life without out Jesus. They think, oh, you got saved when you were young. But I look back and think, man, I wasted. Like, I, I could have known Jesus since I was nine years old instead of 19 years old. It used to be so much fun, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're letting your old friends down, good for you. <laughs> right? Let your friends encounter Jesus through you. We are new creations, right? If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. 
The old is gone. The new is here. Uh, an encounter with Jesus creates a brand new you. Don't be ashamed of your new life. Celebrate it today. We are, the Bible says that we are risen from the dead like Jesus is risen from the dead. It's Romans chapter 6. Yes. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? It? No way. We shouldn't live like that, right? Uh, we are those who have died to sin, and so we can't live in sin any longer. Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through our baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, that we too can live new lives. Hallelujah! Amen! That, that Jesus was, uh, that he died and rose from the dead. Now here's Paul writing to the church, telling us that, that if you become a follower of Jesus and give your life to him, just like him, your old man died, and you are now risen from the dead. Man, some of the things I do still, right? Someone risen from the dead wouldn't do some of those things. <laughs> That's the, so we're going to talk about that too, okay? But Christ comes and he changes everything, right? Revelation 21. He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He makes us new, amen? Don't make the mistake yet. That we make. Man, I make excuses for myself a lot. I know God's grace is good, and I know that God's grace is abundant, and I know that God's grace is sufficient. I also know that we shouldn't just be using God's grace as an excuse to get away with stuff. Yeah. Right? Because of these scriptures right here, God's grace isn't uh, the power to keep on doing the dumb stuff. But God's grace is the power to break away and be free from the dumb stuff we used to do when we were under the influence of the world and the adversary. So Jesus changes everything, and he does that immediately. It's called justification. So there, there is this dichotomy that exists when it comes to our salvation. Uh, the gift of salvation that comes to us through our relationship with Jesus, by the grace of God, it is both immediate and it is ongoing. It is at the same time both a finished work and it is an ongoing process. And we'll talk about how that's possible. When we talk about the finished work of our salvation in church, we use a theological term, justification. And I'll give you some Scriptural examples, probably the greatest one of all time that you could ever find, uh, is Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you're talking about justification, this is the go-to verse, Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that, that you profess your faith and you are saved. You are justified. You are saved. If you are saved, if you're saved right now, this morning, in this room, in your chair, you're never going to get any more saved than you are right now. The adversary does that stuff to us. We're going to talk about sanctification in a minute, okay? But you're never going to get more saved than you are right now. If Jesus saved you, you're saved. Mm -hmm. Justification is the finished work of the cross that takes our sin away from us and replaces it with the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if, you, if you're someone... Uh, that has a battle in your life, and, and it's a struggle, and you and you try and conquer it, and you pray, and you fast, and, and you do good for a couple months or a couple years, and, and then it's just back again, and you fail, and you wonder if you're even saved. 
2 Corinthians 5 and 21, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. That's justification. That Jesus uh, takes in all of our sin, all of our failures, all of our mistakes. He takes them from us uh, into himself, puts, him, puts them on himself, uh, and, and then murders them on the cross, uh, and then exchanges uh, all of our unrighteousness with all of his righteousness. Amen. Immediately. I can talk, I'll talk to you about a couple people that, that exemplify justification. Luke chapter 23, the thief on the cross. Uh, this guy has probably ruined so many religious people's day uh, over the last couple thousand years. Because this guy throws all of the works out the window. Yeah. Right? Uh, Luke 23, the two criminals being crucified along with Jesus. One of them starts insulting the Savior. Says, aren't you the Messiah? If you're the Messiah, save yourself, save us. The other criminal rebuked him and said, don't you fear God? Said you're under the same sentence and we are being punished justly because we're getting what we deserve to get. But this man, Jesus, he hasn't done anything wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and says that simple sentence, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Salvation is not this complicated thing that I make it sometimes, and it's definitely not the complicated thing that the church and religion has made it. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise, in the kingdom of God. How could that happen? Right? Because the thief on the cross could not have earned his salvation. He, he didn't become, all of a sudden, become a better person while he was up there. Right? He, he, he didn't come down and get water baptized. I know that. I, I don't think he got spirit baptized because that happened in Acts Chapter 2, he didn't get to knock on any doors, distribute any tracts, uh, pay any money, attend any services. All the things that us church people have come up with to make ourselves feel like we're climbing the ladder to heaven. All of the work that we're doing. He couldn't do any of it. And yet Jesus tells him, today you'll spend eternity with me. How did that happen? That happened because... He had an encounter with Jesus for himself. He encountered the Savior's justification. It's a finished work. And Paul wrote about it in Ephesians chapter 2. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is not yourselves. You aren't doing anything. It is the gift of God, not by a work so that no one can boast. You have been saved. It happens immediately because it is his gift. Forgiveness, grace, mercy. I'll give you another example. Zacchaeus, right? Luke chapter 19. We know about Zacchaeus because he is just a, an amazing wee little man. <coughs> now see, I'm going to say something. I know some people will be mad at me. I do not miss Sunday school. And I know some people will be mad at me. Church used to have Sunday school. And when they stopped having it, I said, yes. <laughs> okay, sorry, that's just me. Now, here's the one thing I am sad that, that our kids are missing out on. They don't sing about the wee little man, and the wee little man was he, and he climbed up in the sycamore tree because he wanted the Lord to see, right? So that's a bummer for me. Anyways... I'm too old. Half the half people in this room don't get what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'll turn on Zacchaeus. Um, right? Jesus is coming to town. Zacchaeus, who was a, a tax collector, and, you know, one of the big sinners in town, according to everyone else, he has heard about this man named Jesus. 
And he's like, I want to see Jesus. So he climbs up in a tree uh, because he's sure to. And he climbs up in a tree and he's waiting for Jesus to come by. Jesus says, there is a guy in a tree who wants to have an encounter with me. And so what does Jesus do? Of course, Jesus walks straight to him. Right? I mean, there's a guy in a tree that wants to meet me. So Jesus walks straight to the tree. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to have lunch with you today. Everyone, all of the church people are like, I can't believe if he was really a prophet, he wouldn't be going to have lunch with this sinner. He wouldn't sit down and eat with a tax collector. Uh, and Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house uh, and he has lunch with him. And then he makes this amazing statement. He says, today, salvation has come to this house uh, because this tax collector, this Zacchaeus, uh, he's also a son of Abraham. And said, because I came to seek and save the lost. So how did, it, how did that happen? It happened because Zacchaeus encountered Jesus, and it changed his life. Uh, uh, because of Jesus, we are justified and made righteous in the eyes of God. It happens instantly at the moment of our salvation, immediately. Now, let's flip flop. Jesus changes everything immediately. Jesus also changes everything gradually. So you're saying, which one is it, Mason? Does he change everything immediately, or does he change everything gradually? Yes. <laughs> Sanctification, justification, is the finished work of the cross. Sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to make us uh, look more and more like Jesus every day that we're alive on the face of the earth. We'll look at Peter's life for an example of sanctification. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that's important, right? Who do I say that he is? And then Simon Peter said this amazing thing. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said it to Peter. Now listen, because we're, we're going to talk about sanctification here in just a minute. Jesus tells Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I mean just a the most amazing encounter with Jesus that you could ever have. Can you imagine being the person talking to Jesus and he tells you, you're the rock, the, the gates of hell will prevail. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. You'll have the power to bind and loose it, uh, which is just wow, right? Uh, but in the same chapter, just a few verses later, the next conversation between Jesus and Peter we see why we need sanctification in our lives. So Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he has to go to Jerusalem, that he has to suffer many things at the hand of the elders, uh, that he has to be killed, and then on the third day, raised back to life. And Peter took Jesus aside, and Peter began to rebuke Jesus and say, this can't be, Lord, this will never be. Uh, this shall not happen to you. Now Jesus turns to the same Peter. And he tells him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but you're only faking human thoughts about my ministry. Not as awesome as the conversation he had before. How is it possible that in one conversation with Jesus, Peter's the rock, he's promised the keys to the kingdom. And then in the very next conversation, Jesus is literally calling him Satan. 
Well, I, there's at least one I haven't got from the Lord, so. <laughs> it's possible because even though we have been justified, we are being sanctified. It's possible because even though there is the finished work of Jesus' death and resurrection, there's also the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit to, to bring our minds, bodies, souls into conformity to the will of God. That's something as the church we need to remember and we need to give grace to people because I know that you know someone and you have thought about something they've done and you said to yourself, I can't believe that they did that. If they were really a Christian, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't act like that. They wouldn't go that place. They wouldn't do that thing. They wouldn't see those people. How, how is it possible? It's possible because even though we've been sanctified, I mean justified, the Lord's still doing a work of sanctification in us, right? We still make mistakes. I'll give you another great example of sanctification. And it's the Apostle Paul. Paul had an awesome conversion. I, I encourage you, go home, read Acts chapter 9. He's on the way to Damascus. The light comes shining down from heaven, knocks him onto the ground. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I, I'm Jesus that you're persecuting. Get up and go into the city, and I'll tell you what has to be done. Okay. Like the man born blind, Paul had an encounter with Jesus that that was so transformational, once he got into Damascus to the place where he was supposed to find Christians and put them in prison uh, and find Christians and persecute them and find Christians and compel them to blaspheme against Moses and the law of Moses, he gets into Damascus, uh, Ananias comes and lays his hands on him, prays for him, his sight is restored, I believe that's probably when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and immediately Saul, who had come there to do a wreak havoc on the church, immediately begins preaching Jesus in the synagogue so powerfully that, that people can't resist his teaching and preaching, and that everyone's saying to themselves, this can't be the guy. Because we heard about this guy Saul. He was supposed to come here and destroy the church. Now whoever this guy is, he's preaching Jesus, and everyone's getting saved. Paul had his eye encounter, right, that, that became a big-time we encounter. Paul heard about Jesus from other people. <laughs> Paul heard about Jesus from people that were willing to die for their faith. Stephen, right? Paul was there hearing Stephen preached the gospel. He heard it. Stephen say, I see it, the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Father, don't hold this against them. And Saul said, stone him. Paul had to have his own encounter. And after he had it, an encounter. Paul had an encounter, and then a lot of people had an encounter. His I encounter turned into a big time we encounter. We're here in this room this morning because Paul had an encounter with Jesus that he then spread to every person he ever came in contact with. Paul found Jesus for himself. And then people started finding Jesus through Paul, and then people found Jesus for themselves. And, and I thank God that Paul wrote to us about his ongoing need for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in his life. But I have been so thankful over the years, especially probably the last 15 <laughs> The first 15 years I got saved, I was perfect. I could walk on water, and I knew who was right with God. I knew who wasn't right with God. I knew who was going to heaven, who wasn't going to heaven. I knew who was listening to the wrong music, and you know who was listening to the right music. And if it's secular, it's wrong. It has to be on K Love or K Dub or you know some kind of happy station. Uh, 
uh, man, I, that's just the way I was. Then uh, when I started blowing it a lot, I mean, I was blowing it already, but I just didn't know it because it was so young and arrogant and full of pride. And uh, the next 15 years of just making mistake after mistake, uh, I've been so thankful for Romans chapter 7. And, and uh, don't, I don't want to use it again. Don't use Romans 7 as an excuse. Oh, I can do whatever I, I need to do. I can do whatever sin I, I want to do because God's grace. That's not what Romans 7 is for, right? Then. Romans 7 is for, for when you have made that mistake, you turn and see, okay, here's what's going on. The, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit has been happening in my life, but I need Jesus to continue this ongoing work. So Paul wrote this, and I'm so thankful that there was a pastor who was humble enough to say this about his own life and ministry. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but the things I hate to do, those are the things I'm doing. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. This is the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Pastor Paul. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep finding myself going back to it. Now if I do what I do not want to do, well, he could really talk in some circles, though. <laughs> it's not no longer I who am doing it, but it is sin living in me that does it. I find that this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right here with me. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And it's very important we read Romans chapter 7, that you get all the way through to verse 25. Thanks be to God because he delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. It wasn't Paul just putting a period on the fact that I keep failing and I always fail and I'll always be a failure. The end. That's not what he wrote. He said, I have struggles, but I found the way to get to the end of my struggles. And that's coming back to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and surrendering my heart afresh every day to Jesus who delivers me from my mistakes. Amen. Thank you. Paul knew the finished work of the cross. Paul knew he needed the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. We need to have that same revelation in our own lives. Accept what God has done in you. And accept it, that God is not done in you. Right? He's done something in you, but he's not done doing something in you. He has a finished work in us, and he is finishing a work in us. First Thessalonians says, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Right? So, so don't, don't get discouraged and don't give up because the one who called you is faithful and he's going to do it. This is our altar time this morning. I'm going to ask Claudia if she can help me with some altar music. Uh, maybe just keep it down a little bit and then when we get to the altar, you can, when I'm done, you can turn up for us. Um, this is our altar time this morning. I need my own encounter with Jesus. Because when I have an encounter with Jesus, and when you have your personal encounter with Jesus, then we 
we are going to encounter Jesus in a more powerful way. Jesus has already started that work. Some of it, he's already finished, right? You, you have been justified. If you gave your life to him, don't ever receive the condemnation of the adversary. Don't ever let someone tell you that, that you aren't saved because your salvation is a finished work. Okay, but he's also finishing a work. He wants to continue the ongoing work of sanctification in our lives. He wants to do that this morning. He wants to do that at these altars. And so I am encouraging everyone to come down and have your very own 